Uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This month we've been going over a series of kids of the Bible and lessons that all of us can learn from children in God's Word. No matter how old we are, we can always learn from our children. And so Luke chapter 2 gives us the story of the most important child in the Bible, and that is the boy Jesus. And so Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin our reading in verse number 40. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and saw him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give me the words to share this morning. I pray, Father, that, that I will only say what you would have me to say, and I pray that, you will learn, that we will learn from your word what you need us to learn today. We commit this message to your honor and glory alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are a couple of things about this passage up front when you read it that might strike you. It certainly struck me. The first thing is cell phones have been very convenient back here, all right, because Joseph and Mary could just call Jesus on the cell phone and said, Jesus, where are you? I'm in the temple doing my father's business. Okay, Jesus, well, you know, just come along when you're ready. So kind of thing. But they didn't do that. Have you ever lost your child uh, before? And uh, some of you don't want to raise your hand to admit to that. But many times you've been in a situation where your child goes missing. Well, in Mary and Joseph's case, they, they, they lost Jesus. Now, that's a serious thing. And, and you, uh, you wonder, where in the world did Jesus go? And, and, and they understood the importance of who they had as a child here, and they couldn't find him. And so we're going to look a little bit at that. The second thing that I noticed from this passage, it's very important. Uh, if you note some of the bookend passages here, at verse 52, which is kind of at the end of this passage we're reading, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Very similar to what it says in verse number 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Very similar passages. And so Luke is, is talking to us about how Jesus was growing up, how he was becoming strong, how he was becoming wise and knowledgeable and all of that. And all of a sudden, Luke just stops. And he tells us this episode, this episode here that we just read. And then he resumes again and said, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. And by the time you get to chapter 3, Jesus is an adult. So from the Bible standpoint, this is the only story we have of Jesus as a child, uh, other than in, basically in Luke 2. The only story we have of Jesus here approaching his teenage years. He's 12 years old at this time in this episode. Uh, there are apocryphal stories and uh, stories outside the Bible of what Jesus did during this childhood age. And honestly, I would not put a whole lot of stock in that. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been made up over the years about Jesus' life. Uh, there's a reason why we have the canonized Bible, uh, and this, this book right now, all these recorded scriptures in here, are what the early church deemed to be credible based on some, some very high standards of credibility for these texts. And so, so you can take it to the bank that this, this episode absolutely did happen in Jesus' life, and Luke records it because it's important. And the lessons that we see in this passage are important for us to learn. Now, as we dive into this passage, I want to uh, ask a question. You don't need to raise your hand. You can just answer this in your own privacy, your own mind here. But when I first read this passage as a child myself many years ago, I actually sided with the parents. I actually said, you know, I know Jesus is perfect and isn't supposed to do anything wrong, but 
I can understand Joseph and Mary being a little upset about this. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet some of you probably deep down are thinking the same thing. I mean, come on here. You know, if Joseph and Mary, they were leaving. It's time to go. And, uh, and Jesus lingers behind. And then, then they can't find him. And think about it, back in this day and age, there's, there's no cell phones, none of that. And so they have no idea where he's at. And so they're searching all over the place and they're anxious and they're worried. And they finally find Jesus. And Jesus is like, what's wrong? Why are you stressed? Why, why, are, you, why are you looking for me? Kind of thing. And, uh, and then, you know, of course, if you're a parent, you understand why you're stressed. And you understand, you know, it's like my child is missing. And so have you ever seen the movie Home Alone? All right, this, is, uh, this brings to mind that, okay? And, and only Jesus isn't home. He's in Jerusalem. And, and, and so they have no idea where he's at, and so they're, they're anxious. And, but we're gonna, as we dig into this story and look into it, you'll recognize that Jesus was not the one at fault here. And we'll see why. And in fact, what the stages of, of that Joseph and Mary go through are similar to the stages that many of us go through as Christians today, and we'll look at it. Let's look at, at the story here, if, you, if we can, from an outline perspective. Uh, first thing we notice in this story is that, is that Joseph and Mary get separated from Jesus. They get separated from Jesus. They assume that Jesus is with them or that he's going to meet them at the caravan. Now, something, you know, when I, again, when I was a child and I read this story, I, my mind, I was thinking, okay, how does this happen? Joseph and Mary and Jesus. Joseph and Mary leave, and somehow they don't figure out that Jesus isn't with them. And so it's like, you only got three people here. What's the problem? And then they go a day's journey from Jerusalem, and then they realize, oh, where's Jesus? You know, it's like, and, and in my mind, I was thinking there's just three of them. But that's not how things work back in the ancient world. When you would travel from city to city or village to village, you would often travel in large groups. And the reason for that is because safety and security. It just wasn't safe for you to go out and travel alone, uh, with, apart from, from any, any friends or family or anything, because you bandits could come, come along. You know the story of the Good Samaritan? That kind of thing happened frequently back then. And so for safety's sake, people traveled together in large groups. Not only that, but in the Jewish world, you had communities made up of aunts, uncles, cousins, children, you know, parents, all of that. So, so basically, Jesus' family and friends and extended family from Nazareth were coming to Jerusalem for this feast and then going back to Nazareth. And so this was a large group of people uh, that Joseph and Mary were connected to by, by family relations or by friendship, uh, certainly by community relations. And so they were traveling as part of a large caravan. And something else that you'll see in reading through the text, and if you're a Catholic, you may not like me to say this, but it's the truth. Jesus had brothers and sisters, according to the Word of God. Now, um, the Catholics teach that either these brothers and sisters were from Joseph's previous marriage, or they were, in fact, cousins. Neither of those explanations pass muster. Uh, Joseph, there is no indication in the Bible whatsoever that Joseph was married before he married uh, Mary. And uh, also, there's no indication that these are anything but actual blood relatives that Jesus had. So after, uh, Jesus, after Mary had Jesus, Joseph and Mary had a normal married relationship, and they had other children in that marriage. And Jesus had brothers and sisters. We know this from Mark, uh, Gospel of Mark, when Mary and the brothers confront Jesus. Uh, and we know this from uh, the story of the wedding, all kinds of other instances. We know that Jesus had brothers. Um, these brothers did not, we don't know a whole lot about the sisters, they're just mentioned in one verse. We don't even know how many there were, uh, sisters there were. But the brothers, uh, there were four of them, and we know the brothers did not respect Jesus as the Son of God. They didn't accept him as the Messiah. Uh, and so that caused a lot of tension in the family. Now later, they do. The resurrection had something to do with that. You know, when you, you can't dispute, when your brother rises from the dead, that gets your attention, okay? And so, so they, they became believers in Jesus after that. But up until that point, the brothers weren't even present at Jesus' crucifixion. And so up until that point, they were estranged from Jesus. So it wasn't just Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. No doubt by this time, Jesus is 12. It was Joseph and Mary. There are other children in the picture here, and they were part of a large traveling caravan. But somehow during this episode, during this incident, Jesus becomes separated from Joseph and Mary. Now, if you're a parent, your instinct in the flesh is to side with the parents here. But I want you to notice something interesting about this passage. They go to the temple. They're 
in Jerusalem as part of the customs, as part of the feast. And when they had finished the days, they returned, Joseph and Mary returned, the boy Jesus lingers behind. Who left? You think about it in this sense. It wasn't Jesus wandering off. Joseph and Mary were the ones that wandered off. They left. Jesus didn't go anywhere. Jesus remained in Jerusalem. And as we see later when he was teaching the elders and answering their questions and all of that, he was in the temple. So Jesus was on temple grounds in Jerusalem and did not leave from that spot, really. He was there. It was Joseph and Mary who left. Now, Joseph and Mary uh, left without apparently telling Jesus they were leaving and without checking to see what Jesus was doing and why Jesus might want to linger behind and what Jesus had on his agenda. They didn't consult with Jesus about what he was doing. They just left. Now, in this, we see a couple different things. One, they assumed that Jesus would come with them, or assumed, they assumed that Jesus would, would just track along with them. And secondly, they don't show any regard, really, for what Jesus' greater mission was. Now, it's understandable that they're the parents, Jesus is the child, and so they're thinking Jesus is going to do what we say and come along with us. And we'll see in a little bit that Jesus was subject to Joseph and Mary uh, for, for his uh, childhood. But Jesus' greatest responsibility and his most pressing, most pressing duty was to his heavenly father, not to his earthly parents. And if anyone should know that, it ought to be his earthly parents because they were present when all that happened, you know, with the incarnation and the nativity. They were there. They should know there was something unique about Jesus. In fact, uh, it was Mary uh, who named him Emmanuel, God with us. That should give you a clue. This is a different kind of child. And in fact, they're, they're, if you've seen the kid, I don't know, I'm not going to ask you if you've done this, but parents with bumper stickers, you know, my child is on the honor roll, you know, uh, my child is awesome, you know, my child did this, my child did that. And some parents, they're cynical, say, my, my child can beat up your honor roll student child and stuff like that. And I don't recommend that, nothing godly about that. So, um, but, you know, you see all that, well, there was this one cartoon I saw where they had donkeys and bumper stickers on donkeys, you know, in the ancient world. And my child is an honor roll student, my child is this, my child is that. And they showed Joseph and Mary, uh, our son is God, you know, kind of thing, you know. And so you can't top uh, Joseph and Mary. I mean, you know, they, they were raising the perfect child. You think you have the perfect child, you do not have the perfect child. Joseph and Mary had the perfect child. And so they were not assuming there would be any problem here. They were just kind of going along, and they assumed that because they were doing the right thing, they were doing the customary feast just like any observant Jewish family would, any God-honoring family, they were doing the right things, going through the right motions. They assumed Jesus would just track along with them. Now, application to us. How many times is it that we assume that we are doing the right thing? We assume that we're going along just fine and doing exactly what we're supposed to do, and somehow we end up separated from Jesus. Think about that for a moment. One of my wife's favorite songs is from the movie Fireproof, and the song is called A Slow Fade. I think that's the name of the song. It talks about it. it's a slow fade, and how just through slow, imperceptible degrees, you can end up drifting away from the will of God in your life. And you can even be doing good stuff, good things, things that are in the Bible, and you can be doing these good things but you can end up drifting away from what it is. In the book of Revelations, it talks about the church that was doing all the right things, but yet they had lost their first love. They had wandered away. I think of in the early, late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a movement that started called the Social Gospel Movement. Those of you that are historians know what I'm talking about or studied history. Still goes on today, but it became really big during that period. And the social gospel movement was the idea that churches should be about charity work. Churches should focus on charity. We should focus on feeding the poor, housing the homeless, you know, uh, ministering to the sick, all of that. And that should be the main focus of the church. Those are good things. The churches should do those things. Churches absolutely should be involved in charity work. Absolutely. But here's the problem. In doing all those good things, in doing all those good works, many of those churches neglected the original gospel, which was Jesus saves. 
And so these churches were doing good stuff, doing good things, and yet they drifted away from the Great Commission. They drifted away. And we are seeing the ramifications of that today. There are churches all over this community and churches all over this country that if you walk in them, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You go into those churches and they'll sing the same kind of songs that we sing. They'll have the liturgies, they'll recite the scriptures, and they'll be doing great works in the community, but you will never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll never hear about sin and repentance. I could name you some televangelists. I will not, but you can fill in the blanks yourself that are out there and you'll listen to them preach sermons, and many of their sermons say good things. Good motivational stuff, good practical advice, good things, but you will never hear them mention sin or the judgment of God or our need for a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And so these churches and many evangelists and many pastors are doing good things, doing good stuff, but they've drifted away imperceptibly over time, drifted away from Jesus. And now you've got churches, in fact, in America right now, I've talked to some people here in this church that used to attend churches like this, where they will hardly even mention the name of Jesus anymore. And that didn't start overnight. It's not like overnight, you know, they had a pastor that says, you know what, I don't believe in Jesus anymore, we're just not going to talk about Jesus. But over time, over time, the church became more like the world, became more skeptical, bought into a lot of the... uh, higher criticism of the Bible, stuff that you see in seminaries and all of that. And over time, they drifted away. Joseph and Mary were doing good things here. They, they were being good and a good, observant Jewish family. They were going through the motions. They were at the feast. They were doing precisely what they were supposed to do, except they got separated from Jesus. Paul tells us that we are to daily renew our minds. And what I want to do is ask you right now, Are you walking with Jesus? Later, Jesus says, I must be about my father's business, but here's the kicker in that verse. That's a convicting statement that Jesus just made, because guess what? Joseph and Mary are also supposed to be about the father's business. Every one of us here is supposed to be about the father's business. All of us. Here, Jesus was doing what the father wanted him to do, the heavenly father, doing what he was supposed to be doing. Joseph and Mary were the ones that had wandered away. They're the ones that left. And they left thinking they were in the right. This is something that uh, I hope you can get if you get nothing else today. It is possible for you to walk away from God and think you're in the right. It's possible for you to drift away from the Lord's will in your life and yet you think that you're doing the right stuff. You think you're doing the right. Look at how that can be. The next stage that we see is once they, once they got separated from Jesus and recognized that he was not with their kinsfolk, he was not with the company, they became worried. So we see first separation from Jesus, and the second stage that we see here is anxiety. Anxiety. It is a, it is a fact that the further away you get from God, the more anxious and worried you will be about the stuff that's going on in your life. The key to not being stressed out all the time, and all of us will go through seasons of stress. All of us will go through times where where things get more intense and we can get anxious. But the way to get through that period, the way to get over that, is to do as Jesus did, and what he would do is go to the Father and spend time in prayer. When Jesus was anxious, for example, at Gethsemane, what Jesus did is he actually prayed intensely to the Father, so much, so intense, in fact, that he was sweating blood. That's anxiety that Jesus went through. So all of us will go through periods and and times of anxiety, times where we're worried, times where we're going through tough times. That will happen. But what do you do when you go through those tough times? Do you withdraw more from God? Do you get angry with God? Note that the anxiety that Joseph and Mary have here began to turn into anger. And this is a real problem because I have seen it over and over again in my own life and the lives of other Christians where we we, we get separated from God, we're aware of our separation from God, We get anxious and worried, and then we start to get angry with God. Lord, where are you? Where are you, God? What good are you, God? You know, I mean, aren't you supposed to be the God of all power? Aren't you supposed to be the God of all love? How come you let this happen? And we let our anxiety turn into anger toward God. Separation, 
and then anxiety. The key to getting over anxiety is to reconnect with God. But I would like to ask you right now, what is it that you're doing with the anxiety in your heart, in your mind? At the beginning of our worship time today, I read to you Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, I believe, is one of the most uh, moving and just one of the coolest passages in the Bible. I love that chapter. I love the whole book of Philippians. I love the whole Bible, but I love Philippians, okay? Philippians is just awesome, and, uh, and it's one of the most encouraging books you can possibly read. It's also one of the most important, one of the most practical. And you go to Philippians 2, and it talks about having the mind of Christ. and all. It's just, it's just an awesome book. Uh, but in Philippians 4, it specifically tells you what to do with stress and worry. And when you feel anxious, it tells you exactly what to do. First, we're to rejoice always in the Lord. Notice it says rejoice in the Lord. It's hard to rejoice in the Lord if you're distant from God. So go back to that first part. Are you feeling distant from God right now? It's hard to rejoice in the Lord if you're distant from him. So rejoicing in the Lord means to get close to God, to rejoice in him, to get your focus back on him, to start to really just bathe in his presence. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That means Paul thinks it's really important to do this. And then he goes on and says, let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. In other words, your life should reflect that God is present with us. God is here, and we can see God's presence because of your life. That's what Paul is getting at. Church, when people come into our midst, they should know the Lord is at hand because they see the Lord in you. That's the key. Then we go on and says, it says, let your request be made known to God. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Take everything that's bothering you, everything, some people are afraid to pray for stuff because they feel that it's too unimportant. They see what other people are going through, and they feel that their request is too minor. I don't want to bother God with this, because look at what other people are going through. You know, well, you know what? <laughs> if it's causing you anxiety, your Heavenly Father wants to know about it. Not, he already does know about it, but He wants to hear it from you. He wants you to bring it to Him. And if it's causing you stress and anxiety, you need to give it to Him in prayer. That's what He wants from you. And so... We are to take our request, we're to unload our burdens and give it to God, and then we are to meditate, which is a reflection back to verse 4 about rejoicing in the Lord. We're to meditate on the good things that God is doing in our life. And so that is how you reconnect with God if you found yourself getting distant from the Lord, found yourself wandering away from Him. But we don't just see separation, and we don't just see anxiety. The third stage, and this is the interesting one, the third stage is confusion. Joseph and Mary find Jesus. It takes them three days to find him, uh, and it just makes you wonder where they're looking, you know, at that point, but it takes them three days to find him. They find him, and then uh, they, they're telling him, how could you do this to us? No, note the way that that question is worded. How can you do this to us? How often have you said that in your prayers? God, how could you do that to me? Think about that. So they say, you know, Jesus explains, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. In other words, they were clueless. Jesus gave them an answer, and you could just picture Joseph and Mary looking at each other. Well, just come on, let's go. You know, and they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. Have you ever not understood what God is doing in your life? Have you ever not understood what God is saying to you? Have you ever not understood the word of God when you read it? Then you're in good company. Joseph and Mary were right there with you. They didn't understand Jesus, and Jesus was standing right there in front of them, talking to them, and they didn't understand it. That's not a good thing. It's not a good place to stay. If you don't understand Jesus, let me give you some some tips on how to better understand him. And I want you to think in your, in your life right now where you are on these, on these different steps here to how to understand Jesus. The first thing is, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who he is? Jesus, you can actually say, see this in his conversation here. He's saying, why did you seek me? <laughs> why, why, why are you seeking me? And then he says, did you not know? I love the King James Version. Wist ye not know <laughs> that 
I must be about my father's business? In other words, don't you know who I am? Don't you know why I'm here? Don't you remember? And many times we forget who Jesus is. Now, I know that many of us right now probably are going through difficult times or have been through difficult times. If you haven't been through difficult times, it's coming. <laughs> They're coming. All right. But you will have a much easier time getting through that if you remember who God is and who you are in relation to God. Your life is not your own. Your life is not your own. Do you know who Jesus is? Paul says that we are bought with a price. In fact, every single one of Paul's letters, I think most of Paul's letters, he, bring, he starts out identifying himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. James, the brother of Jesus, who writes his letter, starts himself, his letter off identifying himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, not as the brother of Jesus, which would have been correct, but he doesn't. He identifies himself as a servant because at that point he knew who Jesus is. He understood. Now, many of us pay lip service and we think we know who Jesus is, but do we really know who Jesus is? Jesus is God. And when you think about Jesus right now, do you think of him as God? Now, I want you to step back for just a moment. I want you to think about right now your life in your family relations, in your um, political views, in your community relations, in the workplace. I want you to think about your life in all these different areas, your relationships, that you're in your dating relationships, in your marriage, whatever. Do you bow the knee and recognize that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your God? Do you recognize who Jesus is? Stop for a moment and think. We gathered together this morning, and one of, one of my pet peeves is people will come to weddings, and people will go to funerals, and they will oftentimes just go through the motions. And people will come to church, and they'll just go through the motions. I tacked off my good work for the week. I went to church, you know. We even ironically call it church services, so we think that we serve the Lord just by going to church, you know. The fact of the matter is you come to church to be equipped so you can serve the Lord throughout the rest of the week. That's the real key. Serving the Lord is a 24-7 deal, not just a one-day-a-week deal. And so we go through these motions and we do these traditions and we don't put thought into what they are. This is not a game. This is not make-believe. This is not a myth. God is real. Jesus is real. Jesus came to this earth, God in the flesh. This story happened. This is real. It really happened. And there's a lesson for us to know. Jesus then went to the cross for you and for me, was nailed to that cross, died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and on the third day, he rose from the dead and conquered death. And then, 40 days later approximately, he ascends back to heaven, and he left us in charge. Now, God never makes mistakes, but that one you got to worry about, wonder about, you know, all right? But we are the body of Christ now. He left us to be the body of Christ. And for 2,000 years, the church hasn't always done a good job being the body of Christ. Even to, to now. now you've, if you, unless you've been in a hole, you uh, have... Uh, Heard about this website called Ashley Madison. It's been in the news. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians have been caught with accounts on Ashley Madison. And tragically and sadly, according to Ed Stetzer, who's one of our uh, denominational leaders, we're in SBC Church. Brother Ed Stetzer is a uh, consultant, works with a lot of churches, and he's talked with a lot of people in the SBC and also other denominations, and he estimates about 400 pastors are going to be resigning today because they were caught with an Ashley Madison account. I'm not one of them, but I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> so I'm not leading up to anything with that. But, uh, yeah, you don't need to applaud me. Jay would kill me. So anyway, uh, I, um, but the point is, the point is, I think there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians who go, go through life and go through the motions, but deep down you wonder, do you really know who Jesus is? 
Do you really get this? Last week, I talked a little bit about expectations of a pastor. Understand, in 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, it says that pastors are to take the oversight of the flock. And then it talks about, and when the chief shepherd appears, I am going to give an account one day to Jesus, not only for my life, but I will give an account to Jesus for my conduct as the pastor of this church. I am the under-shepherd of this flock. Jesus is the chief shepherd. He's my boss, and I will give an account to him. And he's going to look at me, and he's going to say, Brian, let's talk about how you did at Only Baptist Church. i got to stand before Jesus one day and do that. This is not a game for me. This is real. That's where the rubber meets the road. I know, as sure as I'm standing up here, that one day I will stand before Jesus and give that account That's how serious I take my responsibility here. And it breaks my heart that those 400 pastors apparently forgot that. They forgot that. But guess what? You get to give an account too. We all stand before Jesus one day and give an account. Do you understand? And if you are not a Christian, you will stand at the judgment seat one day and you will give an account for your entire life. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will be judged for every one of your sins. And you will be cast into a Christless eternity. I was talking to a lady the other day, a former student of mine, and I keep witnessing to her because she hates the Bible, hates Christianity, hates God. Ironically, she believes in God and hates him. At least she's honest because most atheists that I meet will say, basically, their argument is, I don't believe in God, and I hate him. <laughs> you know, you're, you're atheists that are angry. I mean, I don't believe in, in the tooth fairy. I'm not angry at the tooth fairy, you know. And so you run, in, you run into atheists, though, and they're angry at God, and it's like, well, wait, what are you angry at? You don't believe in God, you know? What are you angry at? But at least this lady's honest, and she knows the evidence for God is overwhelming, and she's not an idiot. She's smart. She knows that God is real. She knows it, but she hates him. She hates him. Now, I love and care for her, and I'm covering her in prayer. I know her father, who's a missionary, and, and, so, and, and her brother is a, a f- former student of mine that I was very close with, and I, th- th- this family, I really care for them. I really do, and it breaks my heart to see her go through this, and my prayer is that God will get a hold of her heart one day. You know why I care? Because I know this is real. I know this is real. I, it's not a game. It's not make-believe. This is not just, oh, don't look at this just from an academic standpoint. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is a God. There is Satan. All of this is real. And, and one of the, the first steps you've got to take to get close with Jesus and to be walking with Jesus is to accept the reality of it, to know what, take responsibility for it, and then... The second thing, make a decision that you really want Jesus. Know it, and then decide. Decide that you really want Jesus. Hebrews 11.6 says that he rewards those who diligently seek after him. Do you really, truly want Jesus in your life? Do you really, truly want Jesus to be a daily part of your life? Now, some of you are going to unfriend me, probably from Facebook, when I say what I'm about to say. But some of my friends on Facebook who claim to be Christians, I wonder, what are you thinking when you put some of that stuff on Facebook? I know I'm going to count the number of my friends are going to go down after I said that, okay? But here's the deal. You might defriend me today and hide it from me, but you can't hide from God. And you are supposed to be an ambassador and representative for Jesus Christ 24-7. I um, wonder... Christians, when they go through life and they make decisions with respect to their relationships and their kids and their politics and all of that, and I wonder, do you really believe and are you really serious about seeking after God? 
Joseph and Mary got into a position apparently where they were just running through the motions. And if you're a busy parent, you understand this, where it's like you just don't even have time to think. You're just going through the motions, job to job, chore to chore. And many of us get busy and we're just rocking through life, trying to get things done. And we don't take time to stop and think and reflect. Basically, Joseph and Mary were doing exactly what Martha did later, where Martha's running around, you know, doing the busy work, but Mary takes her time to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. And we need to make sure that we are taking time to connect with Jesus, because right now in your life, let me put it to you very bluntly, if you have separated from Jesus right now in your life, and you're not, and you feel distant from God right now in your life, and you're feeling anxious right now in your life, you better stop all the busy stuff that you're doing right now and put a high priority on reconnecting with Jesus because that's what matters more than anything else. You could make a million dollars a year, but if you're far away from God, what good is it in the end? Because you can't take it with you. You're going to leave everything behind. When you close your eyes in death, the only thing that matters is your soul and God. And even in this life, the only thing that gives your life true meaning and purpose is your relationship with God. Make sure you are connected with him and make sure it's a high priority in your life. The third thing in understanding Jesus and making sure that you really understand him is when, as you listen to him, obey him. James says to not just be hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Obey him. Jesus isn't just saying, hey, i got to be about my father's business while he's over here doing something else. He's actually actively engaged in doing his father's business. He's actually doing it. But many Christians today don't even know what God's will is for their life. They don't even know what business they should be about. They don't even know what they should be doing because they've never taken the time to stop and think. And many people get distracted from other things that they're doing right now because they think that, they think that, well, this is important over here and this is important over here. And it is. It may be important. It may be good stuff that you're doing. But if you're not about your father's business, then you're not doing the most important thing in life. Think about it this way. If you're, those of you that are employees right now, you were hired to do a job for your company. You're hired for a specific task or set of tasks or responsibilities for your company. If you decide one day, let's say you were hired to be an accountant, and you go in one day and you say that I'm, gonna, I, I'm hired to be an accountant. You start doing the accounting business. And all of a sudden, um, after three or four weeks, you decide, you know what? This accounting thing is kind of boring. And, uh, and so you decide to do something else. You decide, I'm going to do research. So I'm going to spend my whole day researching better ways for this company to make better products and services. Forget the accounting thing. Well, you were hired to do accounting. And you can do this other research on your own time if you want to, but on the boss's time, you've got to do what you were hired to do. If not, there's going to be some problems. Well, likewise, we as Christians, you understand that what Sheikah said here, and she's right, God has a plan and purpose for you. He has a plan and purpose for you, for your life, for you. He has a calling for you. And I remember... Uh, my pastor I grew up with would, would say things like, the highest calling you could get is to be a pastor. And I don't agree with that. I think that's a very important calling. And I think it's a critical calling. And I think when, 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 the, when the enemy takes a pastor out, it can hurt a lot of people. So I understand the importance of it and all of that. I get that. But I believe the most important calling for you is the calling that God put on your life. Amen. And God doesn't call everyone to be a pastor. God has a different call for each and every one of us, a unique call, and that's the most important call for you. Don't spend your life focused on someone else's call. Connect with God and know what your business is supposed to be. The Father has business for you, and he's got a job for you to do. And we are here to build the kingdom of God, ladies and gentlemen. It's about his kingdom. And so what is your part in building and advancing the kingdom of God and his righteousness for this earth? That is your business. And that's your calling. And that's what he wants from you. And you will stand before God one day and give an account for that. So how are you doing? And some of you might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't know what my calling is. And I would submit to you, if you don't know what your calling is, it's, be, it's go back to step one here. It's because you've gotten separated from Jesus. Get connected with Jesus or reconnected with Jesus and walk with him and you will discover your calling. You'll discover it. It's not like God wants to hold it from you. 
You, know, you ever done a scavenger hunt before where you're like going everything and, and people are trying to keep clues away from you and trick you and all that stuff? Jesus is not up with a clipboard trying to trick you and keep you away from doing his will. He wants you to do his will. But chances are he's going to give you his will and his, his, his calling one step at a time. And so you're going to be, he's going to say, okay, next step, do this. Okay, Lord, you do this. Next step, you go on. Next step, you go on. And he'll lead you step by step through the way. But if, if you're standing back and waiting for him to lay out your whole life plan for you, you're going to be waiting a long time for that. It would be convenient, but it just doesn't work that way. I know because I've tried. You know, as the old saying goes, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, does not work. But the Lord will give you the calling one step at a time. Are you willing to obey it? As the praise team comes forward now for our invitation, I just want to challenge all of you here today. I want you, in the privacy of your own heart, with the Holy Spirit as your witness, I want you to ask yourself, are you walking with Jesus right now? Are you connected to him? Are you in sync with Jesus right now in your life? Number two, are you feeling anxious right now about things in your life? Are you feeling angry with God or with Jesus? You can't be in sync with him if you're angry with him. To confess Christ means that you're in agreement with Christ. Are you in sync with Jesus? Are you anxious at all right now in your relationship with God? Are you anxious about anything in your life? Or do you have that calm peace that passes all understanding right now in your heart and life? If you don't, you can get that. You can get that gift from the Lord today. And do you know what the Father wants of you? Do you know his business for you? Do you know what he's asking for you? And have you taken responsibility for that and embraced that as something that you want to do, as a passion that can just energize you and those around you for the rest of your life? If the answer to those questions indicates that you need some work, this invitation is for you. All of us need work on these things from time to time. This invitation is for you. So let's stand together. Father, I ask right now during this invitation that you'll give folks the courage to step forward if they need prayer on any of these items. This invitation is open and it's for your honor and your glory alone. If people just want to come forward and pray on their own, that's their business, Lord. But just, Lord, I just ask that you just open this time of invitation and reflection up. May we lay all of our burdens before you. May we try to get our lives back in sync with you. Let's not wander away as Mary and Joseph did, but let's stay true to you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.